The Oracle Network. This is Wine, Dine, and Storytime. I'm Nydia. I'm Dana. I'm Cindy, and we're your hosts. Have you ruined a family gathering by asking what wine pairs well with eating a husband? Are you the CEO of TMI? Have you ever been kicked under the table because you brought up your favorite dinner topic, atrocities throughout history? Then this podcast is perfect for you. Each week, Dana and I share stories based on topics that include true crime, historical shenanigans, unexplained mysteries, and all things fascinating, while our amateur chef Cindy prepares themed dinners and pairs wines based on those topics. Find us, the Wine, Dine, and Storytime podcast, wherever you listen to podcasts, and give us a follow. Hey, Rainbow Warriors. This is my disclaimer. Beyond the Rainbow is a true crime podcast. It's not suitable for young children, and maybe not even for some adults. I tend to swear like a sailor, and I'm kind of proud of that. Listener discretion is advised. Hey there, Rainbow Warriors. Welcome to Beyond the Rainbow, true crimes of the LGBTQ+. I'm your host, CJ, and happy Pride, everyone. You can find me on the socials, Twitter, Tumblr, and TikTok at Rainbow Crimes, Instagram at Rainbow Crimes 12, Facebook, and also Instagram at Beyond the Rainbow. Be sure to check out my website at beyondtherainbowpodcast.com. On my website is all sorts of fun stuff. I have a picture gallery of photos from past cases. I have a list of all my episodes. And listeners have asked me how to help support the show. Well, on my website, I have a link to a couple places. One of them is a link to my Tee Public merch store. I have some really cute designs there, if I do say so myself. I also have a link there to buy me a coffee, which is a one-time donation. Any and all proceeds earned will go to bettering the podcast. Also on my website is a list of missing but not forgotten LGBTQ people. This episode's missing but not forgotten person is... Wait, 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 wait. I have to be honest. The person I'm featuring is not confirmed LGBTQ even though she was on my list. And after a little digging, I got to say, I don't think she is. But what we're going to call her is an ally, because she seems like she was sweet to everyone from all walks of life. And she has a really cool name. The woman I speak of is Fauna Fry from Oregon. Fauna's disappearance is super intriguing. And while I'm only going to touch a little bit into it, I urge you to listen to the podcast, Nowhere to be Found, Season 2. The host is Amanda Papineau. And because of my ADD, I normally have a hard time listening to podcasts that do a whole season on one topic. But I have to admit, I was invested in Amanda's whole second season about fauna. Okay, so let me get into what I learned about her case. Fauna is a 45-year-old woman. She stands 5'6", weighs between 135 and 150 pounds. She has a tattoo on her lower back. She was blonde at the time of her disappearance. More on that later. And Fauna has blue eyes. Fauna was reported missing from Grant Pass, Oregon on June 29, 2020, although she was living with her dad in Dexter, Oregon. The past two decades of Fauna's life have been kind of tough. There was a lot of loss in it. It started with Fauna's parents' divorce, and then Fauna's mother passed away in 2002. Fauna then lost her younger sister four years later. In 2019, Fauna's longtime friend and fur baby, Shasta, her pet lab, passed away. Then 10 days before Fauna went missing, her older brother by three years, 
His name was Dallas. He died unexpectedly. He too lived with Fauna and her father John. It's believed Fauna is the one that found Dallas. After Dallas's passing, Fauna had a planned road trip. She was going to go to the Grant Pass area to visit three people. Fauna was taking with her a collection of some of Dallas's possessions. The purpose for her trip was to see the three people, let them know of Dallas's passing, and see if perhaps they might like some of Dallas's belongings. First stop on her list was Dallas's good friend Sean. The other two people are said to have been Randy. Randy was Fauna's mother's partner before she passed. And the third person was supposed to be possibly an ex of her brother Dallas. Fauna felt it was important to tell these people of her brother's passing in person. On June 27th, around 9 p.m., in their home in Dexter, John, Fauna's father, was barbecuing. They were getting ready to have some dinner. John went to use the bathroom in his bedroom. When all of a sudden he heard Fauna at the door and she said, Dad? He said, Just a minute, I'll be there. A few seconds later, he heard her yelling, Dad! When he came out of the bathroom, she was peeling out of the driveway in her 2000 dark blue Jeep Cherokee. John ran back into the house. He turned off the food on the gas stove. He ran to his back porch. He turned off the barbecue, grabbed his keys, and he set off to follow Fauna. This whole visual in my mind is really kind of nutty. Once in his car, John followed Fauna into the mountains in the dark. He came to a fork in the road, and he took a guess which way she went. He guessed she went into the woods. He ran into a carload of guys coming down the mountain. He stopped them and asked if they saw a jeep heading up the hill. They said they had. John was able to catch up with Fauna. When he did, he saw a very uncharacteristic sight. He saw Fauna throwing garbage out the window. You see, it wasn't like Fauna to do that. Fauna, John, and Dallas, they were huge nature people, very environmentally conscious. Being in the great outdoors and animals, that was their scene. And they definitely weren't technology people. They loved to hike, and they usually did so daily. A common daily nature hike could be anywhere from 2 miles to almost 30 miles. And on their hikes, they would always be picking up litter especially plastics, knowing how bad it was for our ecosystem. So for John to watch Fauna throwing junk out the window, he was kind of taken aback. Fauna then maneuvered her car around John a couple of times. John tried to stop her to talk to her, but Fauna didn't want to talk. The last time John got her to stop, he ended up giving in to her urge for flight, and he just told her he loved her as she drove away. Fauna had not taken any clothes with her on her journey, just her brother's belongings. It's not known where Fauna had spent the first night of her trip. It's speculated she probably spent the night in her car. The following day, on June 28th, Fauna visited her brother's good friend Sean, and she broke the news of her brother's passing to him. She stayed only about half an hour, and then she asked Sean to look up an address for her. Sean did so, and this was to be Fauna's next stop, her mother's partner, Randy. On Fauna's way to her next destination, she picked up a female hitchhiker. And apparently, this is way out of character for Fauna to do as well. But she picked this woman up in Wolf Creek, Oregon, and she drove this woman 30 miles south to Fish Hatchery Park. The hitchhiker, with somewhat of a criminal past with drug offenses, was found by the police and she was questioned several times. She's not believed to be a suspect in Fauna's disappearance. Once in Fish Hatchery Park, Fauna purchased two parking passes. One was for that day of June 28th and one was for the following day of June 29th. It's possible she again slept in her car that night. On the 29th, Fauna made a purchase for about $25 at the Cave Junction Chevron gas station and then she booked a room at the Super 8 Motel in Grants Pass, and we know this from her credit card ATM being used. 
Remember how I said Fauna's family isn't big on technology? This would include cell phones. It's possible Fauna had with her her brother's flip phone pay-as-you-go type phone because she did call her father the evening of the 29th, and it wasn't from the Super 8 Motel. Fauna told her father about visiting with her brother's friend, Sean. She also told him about the hitchhiker she picked up, and then she talked about angels, and she told him that she wasn't comfortable in her room at the Super 8 Motel. Her father suggested for the following night that she book a room at the We Ask You Inn. It was a more rustic, cabin-type lodging. Fauna agreed she would do that. After her call with her father, which, by the way, is the last time her father John has ever heard from her, Fauna went to the Fred Meyer store in Grant's Pass. When she was there, she purchased some shampoo, conditioner, a couple of chapsticks, a sandwich, chips, a couple of beers, socks, and some active wear clothing. And it's definitely Fauna using her card because everything she purchased can be seen on CCTV footage. And then it's confirmed she went back to her Super 8 motel room because that's also on video footage. 8.30ish a.m. the following day, Fauna is seen on video leaving the Super 8 Motel. At about 11.45, her debit card gets a hit at the Umpqua Bank in Rogue River, Oregon. Fauna is seen on camera withdrawing $200 cash from the ATM. Nearly an hour later, Fauna's card gets a hit at the Big Five Sporting Goods Store. She purchased a little over $250 in items. Included are a sports bra, capri pants, a three-pack of flashlights, tennis shoes, and a lantern. Around 2.30 p.m., Fauna makes a reservation for a night at the We Ask You Inn. An hour later, her credit card hits at Gooseberries, which is a Whole Foods grocery store type shop. She purchased 10 pouches of tuna, two cans of iced coffee, and a smoothie. Her card has not been used again. Almost three months later, towards the end of September 2020, Fauna's Jeep Cherokee was found by a hunter in a remote location on a back road in the mountains. The keys were not in the vehicle and the doors were locked. The surrounding area where her car was found had clothing that was not believed to be Fauna's. There was also a pair of new crew socks, not the kind Fauna would normally wear, but the socks were found nearby with blood on them. Police have the socks, but no word if the blood type match Fauna's has been available to me. Cadaver dogs were brought out to the location, but Fauna was not located. I guess I delved a little deeper into this case than I had planned to, but it's so interesting. I wonder if she wanted to disappear. Something I failed to mention that was in her car. There was an unopened box of dark hair dye. Did maybe Fauna have more than one box with her? Did she change her hair color? Also, her father John shared that she had been reading a Dean Koontz book. It's called The Silent Corner, and there's a woman in it who goes off grid and into hiding. The other kind of odd thing is that back home on the driveway, Fauna has kind of a brand new BMW sports utility vehicle, and it's just sitting in the driveway. She opted to take her old vehicle. Of course, the new vehicle has the GPS tracker in it, and it could give away her location. Fauna obviously was going through some very tough mental things with her loved ones passing away. No one's really sure what was going on in her head. Fauna's a very private person, and most likely she wouldn't have shared her plans with anyone. But she could be anywhere right now. Her dad just needs to know that she's okay. Her friends just need to know she's okay. If you might have any information, please contact Dave Daniel at the Josephine County Sheriff Department. His phone number is area code 541 450 0518. In my younger days, when I was first coming out, I remember hitting the bar scene pretty much every weekend. We had an awesome lesbian bar in Sacramento called the Buffalo Club, or the Buff for short. 
At the Buff, we had a dance floor, an outside patio, a place for live bands to play, a pool table, and a jukebox. I remember having some really fun nights there. I even remember having a crush on one of the bartenders, a lady named Lisa. Our story this episode is about a lesbian bartender named Jamie Stickle. Jamie was 33 years old at the time she died. Her death is mysterious and highly suspicious. It's also never been solved. In fact, the case is so bewildering, it's not even ruled a homicide. But let me tell you her story, and then we'll look into some popular theories about how she might have died. Jamie was a popular bartender at a small gay bar called Sidekicks in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The bar is now called Their Ultra Lounge. Jamie also lived in an apartment that appeared to be connected to a scrap metal shop called George Warhalla Scrap Metal. Warhalla. I had questions. And yep, it turns out that George Warhalla is a relative to the late great Andy Warhol. Andy just took that untidy little A off the end of his last name. Jamie's apartment and the scrap metal shop are located in an industrial type area in Pittsburgh. It's kind of remote. Not a whole lot of traffic or people around, it seems. Maybe on a 9 to 5 work day. But our story takes place in the wee hours of the night, so there wasn't much traffic then. So tack that up somewhere in your mind, and we'll revisit it a little later in the story. Jamie was very well-liked and very well-known in her community. She was instrumental in organizing fundraisers for many causes. If there was a cause, you can find Jamie organizing it to raise funds. She was also an LGBTQ activist. On February 8, 2002, Jamie worked her normal shift at Sidekicks, and she closed the bar around midnight. No one is quite sure if she started to pregame her drinks before she left work. It's possible, and in my opinion, probable. I'd also like you to know that Jamie was going through a very ugly breakup with a longtime live-in girlfriend. And if I put myself in her situation, drinking heavily to escape my reality would definitely have been an option. First of all, you have the broken heart. And then you have the not knowing if your ex was going to be back at the apartment or not. And if she were, that'd make me not want to go home. We aren't 100% sure if Jamie went home right after work. We do know that she went to another bar, the Pegasus. She drank there for a while, and then she tried to get into another bar, the Liberty Avenue Saloon. However, when Jamie got there, she was turned away from the saloon for being too intoxicated. One article stated that Jamie had gotten into an argument with someone before she left the Liberty Avenue Saloon. That's the bar that she was declined getting into. The Liberty Avenue Saloon was said to have affiliation with Jamie's ex somehow. I'm guessing that all of these bars are in pretty close proximity to one another. It's probably Pittsburgh's neighborhood, And that's because Jamie was apparently last seen by her boss from Sidekicks around 2.45 a.m. He was passing by her as she was in her Jeep trying to get out of a very tight parking spot. Her boss helped to guide her out of the spot, and she was on her way. Between 3.45 and 4 a.m., an Algahaney County Fire Department responds to a vehicle fire on Chesbro Street. The location is the George Warhol Scrap Metal Shop. Firefighters were surprised to find the remnants of a charred body in the driver's seat of a Jeep Wrangler. The body belonged to Jamie Stickle. And I can hear you now, warriors. CJ, what the fuck? What happened in the hour between Jamie leaving the bars and pulling up to where her apartment was? Boy, that's a really good question. One I really wish I had an answer for. Jamie's work keys for sidekicks were found by her landlady when she was cleaning out Jamie's apartment. They were where Jamie normally puts them on top of her refrigerator. 
and that leads those who are close to Jamie to believe at some point between leaving work and having her body found in her car, she returned to her apartment and put her keys up. But police told Jamie's mother, as far as they were concerned, Jamie never made it inside her apartment. Police also found a trail of blood from Jamie's locked apartment door to the driver's side of her Jeep. There was a small amount of blood found on the driver's side door handle of her Jeep and trace amounts found on her apartment doorknob. There's also some strands of hair near the apartment door. Items scattered near Jamie's burnt Jeep were crumpled up money, a lipstick, cigarettes, a partially eaten apple, Jamie's cell phone, a pink plastic flower, and mace. Her apartment and car keys were on the floorboard of her Jeep. Several reports stated that Jamie wasn't a smoker. From past experience, though, I can tell you, warriors, many people who claim not to be smokers, once you put a drink in their hand and a club scene in front of them, they quickly become social smokers. Jamie's autopsy report showed that she had smoke in her lungs, which the medical examiner determined meant she was alive when she was incinerated in her Jeep. Between her blood test and urine analysis, the test came back at 0.25 to 0.28 blood alcohol content in her system. The legal limit in Pennsylvania is 0.08. When alcohol is consumed, it has a very quick and aggressive effect on your body. Alcohol can be absorbed into your bloodstream in as little as 30 minutes after drinking it. So that's a very high alcohol blood content. Because Jamie's body was so badly burned, the medical examiner couldn't determine what she died from. They couldn't find a bullet wound or stab marks, even if they were there because her skin was so charred. If she wasn't shot or stabbed, where did all the blood come from? The medical examiner marked her death as undetermined. And because of this, Jamie's case has never been labeled a homicide. Almost 20 years later, it remains an open investigation. If no new evidence ever arises, Jamie's case might never be solved. So let's jump into some of the theories I've come across for this case. The former detective on the case, who has since moved on to another department, he said he believes Jamie's death was a hit, most likely by someone in the LGBTQ community. So if we look at the hitman theory, it's been suggested she pissed someone in the LGBTQ community off, enough to want her dead. Well, if that member of the community is Jamie's ex, then he could be on to something. Because who else in that community that she loved and helped so much and was a huge support of would want her dead? I've seen rumors that her ex's family might have mob ties, and maybe they called a hit on Jamie. Likely? I have no idea but her ex-girlfriend sounds like a much more logical suspect to me than a random member of a community that Jamie had dedicated herself to. The ex-girlfriend had an alibi that checked out with the police, though. She was at her parents' home. That's a very flimsy alibi. Because, of course, if the parents of her ex thinks that their kid is in trouble, they'd say anything to help their kid, especially if they're affiliated to the mob but police didn't seem to investigate the ex any further. This could also be because of the so-called mob affiliations. Anyone who's ever watched a mafia movie knows that the mob owns many cops. Robin Warder of the Trail Went Cold podcast also covered Jamie's case. This was back in January 2020. He also created a Reddit post for it, and the following theory is paraphrased by me, but the main idea came from Robin's Reddit post. With Jamie's blood alcohol level being as high as it was, and she was driving home, maybe Jamie had hit something. Like, maybe she was involved in a one-car accident. Maybe she ran into a sign or a tree, and she injured herself somehow. That could be what caused her blood trail. 
She went into her apartment, came back to her Jeep, maybe to take herself to the hospital, and the vehicle exploded because a fuel line was punctured. I know, I counted at least three maybes in that paragraph. It's possible, I guess. The Jeep was pretty badly burned and hard to tell if there was body damage to it. In the Reddit post, Robin stated that the fire seemed to have started at the rear of the Jeep because the rear wheels had melted completely. He also mentioned that there seemed to be an accelerant that was used, but they couldn't determine what the accelerant was. I did a little YouTube digging, and it appears that the fuel line of a Jeep Wrangler, it's in the rear. So actually, it's entirely possible Jamie's Jeep had a leak in the fuel line. That could also be the undetermined accelerant. So the paragraph with all the maybes, maybe isn't too far out of the reach of possibility. I mean, just hear me out for a second. Let's speculate. Jamie's drunk driving home, something we all know we should never do. She turns a corner. On that corner is a huge boulder. Jamie turns the corner too sharp and she bounces over the curb and onto that boulder. She looks in the rear view mirror. Whoops, sorry, Rock. She is not realizing that the boulder did some damage to the underbelly of her Jeep. It punctured her fuel line. She pulls up to the parking of her secluded remote apartment. She stumbles out of her Jeep, drops her keys on the floorboard, pulls out the contents of her pockets looking for the keys. Out comes crumpled dollar bills, mace, lipstick, smokes. Oh, a smoke! and she puts one in her mouth. She also pulls out matches, and now she's distracted. So she gets back into her Jeep, she lights her cigarette, and she throws the still-lit match outside of her Jeep, and boom. The leaky fuel line sets the Jeep and Jamie ablaze. Okay, CJ, but that doesn't explain the blood trail. Oh, come on, warriors, do I have to think of everything? Okay. So maybe the bounce from hitting the rock caused her to hit her head on the steering wheel. And it gave her a small cut on her head. Anyone who's ever had a cut on their head knows that a lot of blood comes out of your head. So she gets to her apartment. She turns off her Jeep. She gets out, not realizing how bad she's bleeding. She starts to feel the warm, wet, sticky stuff running down her head. She touches her head. And then she touches the doorknob to her apartment. She realizes she does not have her keys. So she goes back out to her Jeep and she's dripping blood on her way back out to the driver's side of her Jeep. She then starts pulling the contents out of her pocket, looking for her keys again. She finds the cigarettes, puts a smoke in her mouth. She drops the pack on the ground with everything else. The partially eaten apple, I don't know what that's from. But anyway, she again feels the warm, wet liquid running down her face, and she touches it again. She opens the door to her Jeep. She sits down, lights the smoke, throws the still-burning match out the car window, and boom! Now we have a reason for the blood trail and the reason for the car catching fire. Honestly, I could make up stories about what happened to Jamie all day. But the sucky part is, we're not really going to know unless we have more clues. Like, was the car intact enough to see if there was a puncture in the fuel line? Was all of the evidence found on the ground tested for fingerprints and DNA? Did the blood that was found in the strands of hair, did they even belong to Jamie? I'm assuming it did, and that's why we aren't sure if Jamie's death was a homicide. If Jamie had an altercation with someone at Liberty Street Saloon, who was it? And what was it about? And how weird of a dink was it that Jamie's boss is the last person to see her in a parking lot? He helped her maneuver out of a tight spot and didn't recognize that she was most likely too drunk to drive. And why wasn't Jamie's ex question more? It's possible it was an accident. But in all truth, if it was a homicide, I like the ex-girlfriend did it theory. Maybe not with a mafia hitman, but with the ex actually doing the murder. Okay, picture this. The ex was at the apartment outside the door. She was waiting for Jamie to come home. 
When Jamie got there and was drunk, a fight ensued, and the ex clocked her over the head with something. This is the reason for the blood and hair strand evidence at the apartment door. Jamie struggled to get back to her Jeep to get some first aid help and escape her ex. The ex followed her and somehow lights Jamie's Jeep on fire. Yeah, I'm sure my theory has flaws. But I think police dismissing the ex's I was with my parents alibi was super irresponsible and reckless. If you get a chance, head on over to The Trail Went Cold with Robin Warder. Check out his episode 157 on Jamie Stickle. Then hit me up on the socials or via email. I want to know your theories on this case. Love you, Rainbow Warriors. Don't ever drink and drive. And don't ever get into a car with somebody who's been drinking either. And remember, it's not a crime to be gay. Unless you're a murderer. (laughs) 